Uh, hi, my name is Mark Schwetz, and I'm a developer for Chariot Solutions. Uh, last year, we had a lightning talk. It had Artyom Chistakov, a staff engineer at Betterman, talk about learning something new by building a game. And he killed it. And we're so lucky to have him here for a full hour instead of the five minutes to explore the landscape of emerging technology. Now, this session, we're going to ask questions in Slack in room A, but Artyom is going to answer them in Slack after the talk, okay? Uh, so, a little different. Okay, Artyom, take it away. So, right. Hi, everyone. I'm Artyom Shistikov, and this is Choosing Your Giants. In this talk, I'd like to reflect on the methods we in the industry use to choose the specific technologies that power our applications and the way we talk about them. To tell a better story, we'll go back and forth in time, look at some real world examples and examine the status quo. Choice is an intrinsic part of software engineering, but no university prepares us to choose between Ruby and Python, microservices and serverless. We're encouraged to use the best tool for the job, but with few notable exceptions, there is no agreement on what makes one technology superior to another. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Isaac Newton wrote in a letter to his rival, an English natural philosopher, Robert Hooke. <laughs> By the way, the way we look, I expect a mini series about this rivalry to come out any day now. So the letter was a reply to Hooke's invitation for private correspondence and a sort of a truce offer in the latest scientific dispute between the two. In the letter, Newton admits that his views on the subject were informed by the work of Hooke himself, although in Newton's fashion, insinuating that most of this work was rehashed Descartes' ideas. And the shoulders of giants metaphor itself is usually attributed to the 12th century philosopher Bernard of Chartres. Thus, in a single sentence, Newton pays tribute to three different minds. And judging by the portraits, the three men who read their books so he wouldn't have to. <laughs> Seriously, there isn't a single image of Newton holding a book that I could find. Thus, when we say that we stand on the shoulders of giants, we mean that we've learned the lessons of our predecessors and we've built upon their knowledge to enhance our understanding of the world. The metaphor is so intrinsic to the academia's mission that it gets quoted a lot. A cursory search on Google Scholar services some 30,000 quotations among scientific papers and articles. Computer science papers are not an exception, at least not for a while. Here's an excerpt of a published 1968 lecture by Richard Hamming, the Richard Hamming of Bell Labs fame. In it, he coins the still in use edition, in computing we stand on each other's feet. This lecture, oh, by the way, titled One Man's View of Computer Science, is actually about Hamming's desire for a computer science program to incorporate more quote unquote engineering flavor. And he also expresses hope that computer science gets to, quote, situation where we build on top of the work of others rather than redoing so much of it in a trivially different way. Like the title of this 1993 paper by Elizabeth Smith suggests, the giants of the first decades of computer science were people like Boo, Shannon, Turing, von Neumann, and others. But then something interesting happens. In 1998, Christine Pearson coins the term open source. It gets picked up and spread by Eric Raymond, Bruce Perrins, and others, and suddenly the references change. Now the giants are not the knowledge of others, it's their code. Open source becomes the industry programmer's answer to academia's tradition of reusing knowledge. It is no surprise that Linus Torvalds, the creator of the Linux kernel, wrote the following in Just for Fun. To make Linux usable, I had relied on a lot of tools that had been distributed freely over the internet. I had hoisted myself up on the shoulders of giants. The most important of these free software programs was the GCC compiler. Torvalds mentions Shoulders of Giants multiple times in his memoir, but this was the one that stuck with me when I read it back in college. This idea of new tools and code being built almost literally on top of the old ones had a profound influence on me and my post-dot-com boom generation of programmers. So as an application developer, I might see the Shoulders of Giants like this. 
First, there were humans who defined our field, the likes of Ada Lovelace, George Bull, Alan Turing, John von Neumann, Grace Hopper, and others. Then, mostly ignoring hardware, because that's what we software developers do, uh, there are all these foundational efforts like Linux, GCC, or GNU. Some of those have loosely assigned human names, but I bet most users wouldn't know them. Then there is another layer, my language uh, runtime, my database upon which hinges the dwarf of my app. As this pyramid of progress illustrates, in its ordinary fashion, tech takes something that was intrinsically human and makes it about tech. Computer science, and especially the tech industry, began to view open source and other people's code in general as a driving force for progress. It bears the question whether code is a form of knowledge, a storage device, or something else entirely. One common view is that code is a form of literacy. We organize our books of code into software libraries. We obsess over style, languages, and pick our favorite authors. But something unexpected happens as we translate our knowledge into code. Like literature, code exists in a certain context. It's written for a specific microarchitecture, operating system, compiler, or interpreter. It's opinionated and often biased. Different programs providing similar functionality often exhibit what seems like different physical properties, which is uh, why many programmers like the construction metaphor. We get to decide whether to build out of reinforced concrete or wood. If reading is the primary way of interacting with books, the primary way of interacting with code is through execution. Reading is something we defer for, uh, for when the code doesn't work as we want. We read the API reference and the tutorial if available, but we sure hope that we won't ever have to look too closely into the implementation of an encryption algorithm we're using. We reserve reading others' code for when we assume the results are wrong, like Newton. Even if the source code is readily available and we're willing to investigate, we're faced with resistance because the very structure of code obscures the underlying knowledge. Humans write code to share their expertise, but things get lost in translation, and the code you get is a mere trace of the author's understanding. It follows that the ultimate goal of code and technology is not enlightenment, but utility. Ironically, the best code is the code you never have to look at. One might even conclude that, by corollary, we should rely on the third-party code giant as much as possible, aggressively minimizing our own code base. This, however, is a trap. More often than not, the problem of choosing what technology to use faces the dilemma of comparing multiple solutions that we don't understand and honestly don't want to understand. We are forced to judge based on appearance and on the visible advertised properties. To make this more clear, let's consider an example. We take an 18th century Bayes theorem. By the way, Thomas Bayes didn't come up with the theorem, but he did some good work in the field, so it was named after him, kind of like we did with Haskell. In, in the 60s, text retrieval researchers community uh, turned, into what we now, uh, turned it into what we now know as naive Bayes classifier. A very simple machine learning technique you could, for example, use to tell if a given song lyric is by Kanye West or not. Today, you can leverage that entire swath of knowledge by programming it from scratch in a dozen lines of Python, or even fewer if you use the popular scikit-learn package. Or maybe you could deploy an Apache Spark cluster and use that. Or fumble with Weka, anyone still remembers that, until it inevitably crashes, and then maybe you open your browser and use Wolfram, uh, because surely it supports naive base as well. I'm not even going to check. So every single one of these packages will get the job done. And if the math is correct, you should even get the same results on the same data set. Everything is a song by Kanye West. So yeah, tech is confusing. In this case, we have the same knowledge, but different giants. Like Jessica Kerr declared yesterday, the code is not the model. Perhaps at the dawn of computer age, a mathematician's dream for modern computers would be an Oracle-like machine that has a universal interface. 
You know, uh, you, you show it some scribbles on a piece of paper and it gives you the answer you seek. Perhaps this will be true someday. For us today though, it's clear that if you know how to use Wolfram, it's not a given that you have the skills to use Jupyter Notebook to get the same answer. You can learn to use Jupyter, but it's still a different giant. <laughs> In fact, it's not, it's not a given that if you use Python five years ago, you can still use it today. That's a Python 3 joke right here. Uh, I'll stop now. <laughs> in, in tech, uh, giants have agendas. And this was always true to a degree. Scientists are known to use their theories to promote their religious and political, political views for centuries, or you know, just be weird about sharing their findings. Our friend Newton uh, was known to be extremely secretive about his studies. Like that one time when he invented this thing called calculus in 1660s, but would refuse to share it until early 1700s. Meanwhile, he dropped references to it in other papers he published, infuriating his contemporaries, including Robert Hooke. Still, one of the key differences is that once you grant someone knowledge, it's practically impossible to take it away. With tech, there are more things to consider. To make this even clearer, let's make a small update to the pyramid from earlier. Our giants are not limited to executing open source and proprietary code on our computers and servers. We also rely on various cloud services, primarily provided by for-profit companies. For our businesses, this is a powerful opportunity to save costs and increase productivity, endorsed by Brooks himself and mythical man month. Oh, by the way, cloud service providers love the metaphor. Since we already refer to many of them as tech giants, it makes their pitch even more convincing. The message is, code is not a superpower. In fact, code you found on the sidewalk is a liability. The real giant is the service. Code combined with expertise and 24-7 support. Until one day you open your inbox and uh, find out that the API you're relying on and often paying for is being replaced with a vastly improved version uh, in a few months. Or being shut down entirely or worse, silently dropped. One project I worked on used to offer integrations with dozens of software development services mostly issue trackers and messaging apps, and it was practically a full-time job just trying to keep those integrations alive between regressions, deprecations, and improvements introduced by the vendors. And open source is not static either. Uh, project owners have their priorities and they push their creations in directions you don't necessarily agree with. Some of you might remember the left path disaster but I also found this paper by Charles Axon from Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You know, people who literally do rocket science. It's actually a big rant on how NASA cannot use anything open source without regretting it. Apparently they used Qt as a GUI framework for their mission visualization tool and the update to the latest version quote wreaked havoc with it. I'm sure it's fine. That's to say, you're, you're not in control of your giants. Here's my absolutely scientific estimation of how much control you have over various kinds of code. Your own code, the open source tools, proprietary and cloud. Now, before someone yells, this is why we can run 15 year old, 10,000 lines C code to simulate pandemics. Oh, let's clarify that this is also roughly the graph of how much time you're going to spend programming before shipping something useful. The giants we deal with in tech are not the magnanimous thinkers of yore. They're fussy, wild, and they will not care if you lose balance and fall to the ground. The act of standing on their shoulders is an acrobatic dance that requires all your dexterity. Their dependencies and their liabilities, you always incur the initial adoption costs learning and integration, and then potentially forever, you bear the costs of maintenance and deal with possibility of dependency-related vulnerabilities or conflicting agendas. I want to emphasize that technologies are not abstract, they're very physical, and one of the best illustrations of this is recruiting. Here is a real email I received from a recruiter a few months ago. It tells a lot about our industry. 
And one of those things is that employers value experience with specific technologies. I used to share this idea of an engineer who is completely technology agnostic, but I haven't found it to be true. Here's another one to keep you entertained. Am I the only one getting these? <laughs> it, it, it took me at least a year to become proficient in Ruby, and I was an experienced programmer at the time and had good mentors. I also think it would be reasonable if the first two years worth of my closure code, or maybe all of it, were moved to a nuclear sto storage facility for the next 400 years. Programming languages take the most to internalize, but database or even some labor libraries and APIs have really steep learning curves. I understand that saying that technology agnostic software engineer is a myth is a strong claim, and some of you may disagree. But maybe we can agree that experience with a particular technology is at least somewhat import important. It's good enough for now. I already mentioned the 1968 lecture by Richard Hamming, but here's a, another quote from it. Let me make an arbitrary distinction between science and engineering by saying that science is concerned with what is possible, while engineering is concerned with choosing from among the many possible ways one that meets a number of often poorly stated economic and practical objectives. It is not usually a question of can there exist a monitor system, uh, algorithm, scheduler, or compiler. Rather, it is a question of finding a practical working one with a reasonable expenditure of time and effort. If engineering is a science of choosing, how do we choose? In 2016, when I was working at Wildbit, another team began laying the groundwork for a project that will later become known as Conveyor. They had a very ambitious vision based on a decade of experience running Beanstalk, a collaborative version control hosting and deployment service. For this new project, however, they had to tread unknown territory. Instead of familiar web, Conveyor was to be an app that's always running on the developer's desktop, connecting their code editor to their issues and their deployment environment. Now they have to choose their toolkit in this unfamiliar landscape. Their reason reasoning went like this. The desktop app we love the most are the native apps written specifically for Mac OS. We want to show the same level of love and care to our future customers. To compensate for the lack of experience, will hire several platform experts. If the project gains popularity, following this direction will eventually build native clients for Linux and Windows, potentially figuring out code reuse as needed. When they presented this plan to the larger team, no one could point to any significant flaws in their reasoning, myself included. In a fantastic 2018 write-up titled Blood, Sweat, and Tears, How We Built a Mac App and Threw It Away, my friend and colleague Ilya Sabanian documents what happened next. The agile process they were used to when working on the web didn't translate onto the desktop environment. There was the rigid handoff process from designers to developers, endless fit and finish iterations that never seemed to yield the desired result. Their bet on Swift as a programming language also didn't pay off, as the original version was fraught with bugs, lacked documentation, and would often break Xcode. They endured all of this for over two years, uh, all while searching for the right product configuration. In the end, they had a version of the app that did what they wanted, but in their words, they weren't proud of it. So they made the hard decision to rewrite it using Electron a way for them to use familiar web technology on the desktop. The dramatic increase in velocity was apparent from the early days of the rewrite. It wasn't just the technology choice. It was a more efficient process that it enabled. About the same time as the conveyor rewrite was unfolding, someone recommended me Scott Rosenberg's uh, book, Dreaming in Code, which documents the development of an open source personal information manager called Chandler from 2001 to 2008. This book is absolutely fascinating, and I recommend it to everyone in the virtual audience. It's well written, it's fun, and it's incredibly insightful. Rosenberg, a journalist who describes himself as only a newbie, pro newbie programmer, makes observations uh, that never uh, occurred to me as a professional programmer. Chandler was a love child of Mitch Kapoor, the co-founder of Lotus, which you may know for creating Lotus Notes. He wanted to use his fortune to pursue a grand vision of a personal information manager that would 
finally fulfill his dream of a piece of software that would encompass not only all his contacts, calendars, to-do lists, and email, but also his music library, his photo album, and his website. It would support peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and would be developed as an open source by a nonprofit organization called Open Source Applications Foundation, or OSAF. Chandler is a story of an ambitious, idealistic uh, vision that faced the messy and volatile reality of software developer development. <laughs> In a field as young as software engineering, Greenfield is terrifying because there are so many choices to be made. Rosenberg's account makes it clear that in Chandler and in most other projects, these decisions are often driven by developers and product owners' ideology. Even before the project started, quote, the only other thing Kapoor was sure of was that he wanted the new product to be open source. Or another one, Kapoor's experience in Java left him doubtful that it could build the sort of beautiful, intuitive, graphical user interface he dreamed of. And so they settled on Python, even though all of their original engineers were primarily skilled in Java. They also had opinions about GUI frameworks. WX widgets wasn't quite there yet. The Macintosh tools were especially underdeveloped. But with a little more effort and time, Anderson believed it would work for OSAF. None of these are expressed as technical decisions. They are declarations of beliefs that might be based on comparing docs, building small, small prototypes, and trusting developers' own intuition. But that's not because OSAF don't take choice seriously. They realize that they don't have unlimited time to decide on the stack, so basing decisions on intuition and experience is perhaps better than at random. I'm sure most of us have been there. Both OS uh, Wildbit and OSAF uh, had experienced leaders and engineers with a track record of shipping delightful projects on time. Wildbit launched four successful services before Conveyor, and OSAF consisted of an all-star team of folks with impressive achievements. Both Conveyor and Chandler eventually reached versions 1.0, and whether Conveyor's fate is not sealed yet, Chandler's first and last releases happened in 2009. Making wrong choices and trying to correct them gracefully is a big part of this job. So I'm grateful to Wildbit for sharing their story and to Scott Rosenberg for writing Dreaming Code. Now we can learn from their experience and these lessons to me are the following. At the project start, you're the most vulnerable as you're yet to establish your footing. If you place a bet, uh, a bet on unknown technologies, that's an additional risk. Bringing experts can help manage this risk. Both the organizations hire a domain expert, for example, but it's not a panacea and you need to make sure experts are empowered to make a difference. Most importantly, don't expect the new technology to guide you to the right solution. You are in charge of your design. Finally, plan that you won't get it right on the first try. Perhaps the main struggle of both Conveyor and Chandler was that they attempted an ambitious integration of multiple tools, so there was no minimal prototype they could demonstrate uh, the project potential. Not all projects are like this. So work in vertical slices, is shipping minimal solutions and adjusting your methods as you go. But what should these methods be? By nature, software is nuanced and abstract, and neither our brains nor our computers like nuanced and abstract. They want things to be, well, <laughs> binary. Programmers like when everything is a file, everything is an object, a function. It's only natural that we came up with similar shortcuts for rationalizing our technology choices. One example is technology doesn't matter. It's rare to hear it from an engineer unless they're being intentionally facetious, but it's often touted by various startup founders and medium. It usually starts by stating that the customer doesn't care how the product is built. A casual reference to a no silver bullet can be thrown in, implying productivity gains no longer come from tools and most modern technologies more or less the same. In general, the sentiment that technology matters are a distraction for the business. A signal like this especially embraced by the leadership, can be dangerous. It rewards shipping features over careful engineering, which might be a viable short-term strategy, but inevitably catches up with you. In terms of choosing, it relegates choice to trusting the first Google result. It's efficient, but this efficiency comes, uh, does not come for free. 
A weaker option of this shortcut is choose boring technology. There's always a senior engineer on the team who's quick to yell this whenever somebody asks whether they should use Postgres and Mongo for this new app they're working on. The senior engineer has seen things fail in production, and for them, boring means mature and free of surprises. What they mean is that the failure modes of boring technology are well understood. It will be easy to Google answers, hire people, and find packages for CentOS 6. Finally, the fewer tools you use, the easier it is to achieve real mastery. Like any conservative strategy, this shortcut minimizes risk. And when used mindfully, it can result in pragmatic architecture that's stable and benefits from consistency and lack of fragmentation. However, an overeager reliance on it can create a culture that's inimical to creativity, where every attempt at innovation is met with, ah, don't waste our time, just write it to Postgres. It's easy to see how this can be a path to technical stagnation. To really work, it has to be more nuanced than this. And Dan McKinley, who owns the BoringTechnology.club domain, has a very entertaining talk that, aside from stating the listed benefits, goes into detail on the process for adopting shiny new technology. Another well-known strategy is uh, nobody ever got fired for choosing IBM, where IBM can be Google, Amazon, Facebook, you name it. What's important is that we delegate our decisions to an authority. Perhaps the classic enterprise version of this is buying a software package with a 10-year warranty. But there's also the modern interpretation, which is, um, I bet Netflix figured it out. Tools backed by tech giants can indeed be of high quality and are more likely to become de facto standards, generally take security seriously, and thus embracing them can be a viable strategy. Perhaps the main argument against it is that these tools are optimized to the giant scale, and it's probably not your scale. Managing a Kafka cluster can easily be a full-time job for a small team, which might be acceptable to a tech giant, but as a small company, this can quickly become overwhelming. Finally, one of the most prominent shortcut philosophies when it comes to choosing software is the right tool for the job. It's so cleverly phrased that it's hard to disagree with, oh yeah, I want to use the right tool for the job. On the surface, it may seem that it's concerned with something trivial, like not storing huge data blobs in a relational database. By the way, done that. Or not using a search index as your primary database. Definitely done that too. Or another interpretation can be that we must always consider all available options and pick the best alternative which would be laudable, but it's barely practical as it's often impossible to know all of your available options or even decide which one is objectively the best. Even worse, right tool for the job completely ignores the question of expertise. It assumes that alternative tools just lay there, waiting to be picked up. And once you do, you can wield them like a pro from day one or after short training. In my experience, it may take years to gain proficiency with a technology, especially a programming language that's sufficiently different from what you're used to. In practice, the right tool for the job is most often used to make an argument for polyglot programming, microservices, and that hot new database that Hacker News is excited about these days. Don't get me wrong, if you can chart out the boundaries between your business domains in such a way that enables their owners to pick their tech stack without everyone else suffering, it can be empowering. For example, you probably should find a way for your data scientists to use Python R or Julia. Uh, what you shouldn't do is adding a graph database for that one query that looks weird on Postgres. This list is not exhaustive and there are some fun variations like the best new tool for the job. Not invented here and it's dark twin. Please do not reinvent the wheel. None of these are mutually exclusive either. At some companies, you might find that different engineers follow different philosophies, often reaching a kind of fragile equilibrium that seems to work somehow. Shortcuts are so nice because they make us feel good by expressing our ideology, and they also save us time by not having to look at too many options. There, there are indeed rigorous methods for evaluating alternatives out there, one could seek inspiration in the construction industry, but even in software, organizations like NASA have suggested comprehensive frameworks. Should we all be using them? Maybe, but I have never been given more than a few weeks to decide on tech in my career. This is just too hard. So what should we do? 
Ultimately, I believe that choice and technologies are always going to be hard. However, over the years, I've converged on a kind of framework that I find helpful when discussing the choice of technology for systems I have helped build. It's not my invention. I believe other people have found it too by following experience and intuition. Michael Polanyi used to say, we can know more than we can say. But it's always an interesting experiment to put internalized knowledge into words. I hope you'll find it useful. If choosing is always going to be hard, we better get used to making mistakes. So our goal here is to minimize the risk of making the wrong choice. On the system level, we do this by sticking to a set of well-known abstractions. Most technologies fall into some category, blob storage, fast access key value, relational database, queue, RPC, etc. You don't want Amazon Lambda. Paraphrasing Dan Chusborn Technology McKinley, if it turns out that your problem is that you're not using Amazon Lambda, but maybe you could, oh, that's, it's real nice because you could establish that and never talk about it again. However, you might want to deploy a small unit of functionality with predictable billing model. And this might lead you to considering AWS Lambda because, for example, all your other stuff is in AWS. Once you know what kind of abstraction you want, you need to establish a boundary. As you have probably guessed, we use interfaces for this. For a key value storage, it's just a set and get methods. For a queue, the simplest interface is just in queue, DQ. But you might want to add X, prefetch, et cetera. In my experience, it's not the end of the world if your abstractions develop some adaptations over time and grow roots into your system. For example, not every queue implementation provides a peak method which is look at the next element without claiming it. But if yours does, it is probably okay to use if necessary. Also, you don't have to abstract away every dependency. Unused degrees of freedom will atrophy, but may leave scars. So generally prefer direct over indirect pace, over, uh, pace off over time. Finally, everything is not a something. For example, these days you might decide to use a relational database as your data store, queue, key value, and maybe something else. This is fine, because relational databases are some of the most high leverage technologies we have available. Still, I encourage you to establish appropriate interfaces for every different use case, even though the po they point to the same underlying implementation. This is not a premature abstraction or an unused degree of freedom. This is your way to communicate intent to other developers. Please do not enqueue items via SQL insert and future engineers will thank you. Now you need to establish your core business logic. Let's use an example here. When I was working on a deployment service product written Ruby on Rails, our core business logic was the said deployment ed engine that had to connect to people's servers via various protocols, upload files and do things. The original deployment engine was very closely tied to Rails Active Record ORM and a third party state machine library. This unnecessarily complicated Rails upgrades because any change in Active Record would introduce some hard to track issues. We ended up rewriting the majority of the engine in plain Ruby and covering it with a lot of tests. This also resulted in a cleaner, well defined interface, which is often a consequence of test guided rewrites. Okay, we've narrowed down a required set of abstractions and demarcated our core business domain. Now we still have to choose the abstracted implementations. At this point, you should have relegated the role of every abstraction, including the core, to a well-defined interface, so the risk of choosing the wrong thing is much lower. Keep in mind that it's always prudent to spend your innovation tokens wisely and choose the most stable solution that can satisfy the desired interface. You might find that there are high lever leverage solutions, aka frameworks, that can provide reasonable defaults for many abstractions and satisfy your interfaces. The choice is still hard, but not impossible. At this point, you can choose your own difficulty and even using a reasonable shortcut can be a valid strategy. You can also perform the due diligence or maybe have your procurement department do it uh, for you if that's your scale. I realize this may sound extremely vague at this point, so let's consider a simple but practical example. 
Suppose you are asked to build a service that receives emails and sends a weekly digest cons consisting of last seven days of emails. We'll assume that there's just one inbox for the sake of this exercise. Um, and yes, we ask the user if they can use Zapier or something, but they wanted real programmers to build a real system and a real system we must deliver. It would be a lot more fun to start with Kafka versus Kinesis discussion, but we'll begin by defining things we're going to do in any case, which are extracting metadata from RFC 5322 compatible email format and combining multiple metadata entries into a digest. It seems like a reasonable assumption that any ingestion mechanism we decide on will provide raw email option. There are pretty good email parsers for practically any mainstream programming language, but we'll keep in mind for later when we have to commit to language. However, if our company has a prescribed language, we can let someone leave the meeting right now and st uh, let them start implementing the core library. We're lucky that our core functionality is free of side effects, and we should strive to keep it this way because it makes testing and integration a lot easier. Now, all engineers at the table seem really worried about the part where we receive email from customers. Somebody is saying we might need both an email server with SMTP and POP3 IMAP support and an email client to interact with the said server. Both Postfix and Dovecot get brought up, which is honestly just terrifying. Somebody says we could maybe use the corporate Gmail account for this, but other people are worried about the spam filters or there are also these third-party email services with inbound support. This discussion is getting out of control because we've allowed specific technologies to take a seat at our table too early. If we take a step back, we might realize that the only thing we need to know about email at this point is that both boundaries of our system use the SMTP interface, the protocol for transmitting email on the internet. Thus, let's start by drawing these in and out boundaries. We'll consider one incoming email an event. Our specs aren't clear about how many events can enter the system within a seven day period, but we know that email is a public service, so we're exposed to the violent world of spam robots and influences uh, new newsletters. In such case, it usually makes sense to give ourselves extra capacity by putting Q at the door. We'll consume that Q and put events into persistent not, uh, storage. Then once per week, we'll have a scheduler trigger a runner job that will read from the storage and use our uh, core domain logic to build and hand off the digest email to the sender, which will deliver it across the output boundary of our system. Somebody also pointed out that if our consumer doesn't do any pre-processing, that entire section can be potentially replaced with a persistent queue. Good point. Okay, I think now we're ready to consider different implementations for this input boundary by fitting them to our desired abstractions. A traditional email server can be used both as a queue or a persistent queue. As a persistent queue, it will even start to put back pressure onto the producers once the inbox fills up, asking them to try again later. This is built into the email protocol. The interfaces are very email focused. You get stuff in via SMTP and you get stuff out via POP3 or IMAP client. POP3 would imply polling the server regularly, but IMAP supports kind of long polling setup. It might work, but we can agree that this sounds like a very unusual queue. So we increment our risk counter. For practical considerations, we are responsible for everything within the boundaries of our system. Delegating an important unit to, let's say, Gmail built for consumer or business email use case and not, not generally advertised as a persistent queue <laughs> sounds like a significant risk. If we already run our own corporate email infrastructure and consider using it, there might also be some uh, competing priorities between our app's use case and the system administrators. So that's also a risk. But in the latter case, we have some in-house expertise, so maybe spinning up an entirely new cluster for our purpose could be viable. We could also run a standalone SMTP server like Postfix. In this case, it acts mostly as a translation layer from SMTP messages to our system events. There's some added complexity in getting things from Postfix into our queue, which now we'd also have to choose. Additionally, there are third-party services like Postmark or Mailgun, 
that, that can handle email interface complexity for us and translate it to a more commonplace app level protocol like HTTP webhooks. Such service can replace both the queue and sender components. Our consumer would have to become a web server though, which has to be deployed somewhere and needs a hosting, a TLS certificate, some kind of authentication method, but the service cost is attractive and we no longer need the expertise of running these unknown email components. HTTP seems a lot less risky in that regard. There's one more interface we haven't considered, which is native interface or the monolith. What if our entire app is a single service that speaks SMTP, writes to local persistent queue using a library, then once per week it empties the queue into a digest? This could very well work. There are SMTP server libraries that you can embed into your app. And integrating pieces is always easier inside the monolith. There are fewer interfaces to worry about. The risks are primarily the code base getting out of control over time as the lines between the abstractions blur due to adaptation. So we have identified what seem to be two options with relatively low risk for our input boundary. However, this decision between monolith versus distributed systems seems like a big one. A clearer requirements or an existing precedent could help resolve this argument, but in other cases, it comes down to your engineering principles. Some engineers cringe when they hear about principles. Principles are those vague sentences the VP of engineering posted on the blog that everyone only looks up when it's time to write peer reviews. It doesn't have to be like this though. It's, if written with practical purpose in mind, principles can be an effective tool for spreading consensus. Here is an example of an engineering principle that we have at Betterment. We don't build software in-house if the domain is not a core differentiator of our business and we can find a trustworthy, high leverage, philosophically aligned product, service, framework, or library, or one that can be wrapped up in a philosophically aligned interface. Because focus is precious and we've got more than enough hard problems ahead. <laughs> True, this is not as t-shirt worthy as choose boring technology or right tool for the job. It advocates a practical point of view, but leaves rooms for nuance. We also have principles about how our apps communicate, how we test, and others that answer all sorts of questions. Principles are not static and will likely change as your company grows. As we've established before, technology likes to take the spotlight, but it's people who make things happen. My final piece of advice is that you should try to foster a culture of diversity, curiosity, and knowledge sharing. Hiring people of diverse experiences is a good lever for expanding the pool of expertise within your company, which reduces the search space when choosing. Second, don't forget that people might have hidden preferences. In fact, they might quietly hate the guts of your beloved Postgres cluster because they've internalized MySQL commands at their previous job. They're unlikely to advocate a migration, but antagonizing MySQL or any other technology is a good way for them uh, to make them feel alienated. Alienated people are not gonna be excited to work on your perfectly designed system. Create an environment, call it labs, hackathon, anything, uh, where they can channel their curiosity and keep your mind open. Maybe it doesn't make sense for your company to use Docker but you can steal some ideas from it and improve your architecture. The described framework is not one size fits all. It should be implemented by using a governance style appropriate to your company size and possibly the industry. For a small company, let's say less than 20 engineers, but maybe a little more or less, it is what I call architect. Your primary goal should be eliminating chaos. You should try to have one answer per abstraction and maybe make sure everyone sticks to the blueprint. You can probably get away without explicit principles as the knowledge more or less flows naturally through the company, especially if the architects are strong communicators. When choosing technology, you'll probably want to stick to quote unquote boring stuff, but some interesting tech might also be an opportunity. There are success stories out there like Nora Dink and the Elm programming language and others. A larger company will want to transition to city planner methods. At this scale, you have to deal with chaos. P 
people are gonna do weird things with their houses. They're gonna throw dumpster pool parties. I hate Philly. And they'll want to have identity for their neighborhoods. Give them infrastructure, establish zoning laws. Just don't let them destroy the city. At this scale, principles become important and knowledge sharing has to be a mindful effort. Same when it comes to diversity and knowledge sharing, where small companies can get a pass because of their somewhat limited ability to control this, a large organization that lacks diversity indicates a leadership failure. Finally, I've never worked at a tech giant, so I won't embarrass myself by making it up, but I assume the governance style has to be even more meta, but don't take my word on it. Send the links how you do it. All right. If you took a nap during the last few slides, here's a short recap. Use a fixed number of well-known abstractions and interfaces. Don't let technologies take over your design discussions. Protect your business domain from giants, aka technologies. Be mindful of the number of dependencies you take. Communicate your principles. Foster diversity, curiosity, and knowledge sharing culture. Govern according to your scale. Be nice to all people. As we've seen, Standing on the shoulders of giants is a difficult trick. However, it's also the, the one we do almost without thinking. Robert Burton said, a dwarf standing on the shoulders of a giant may see farther than a giant himself. And perhaps that's what we should remember. We don't climb onto the giant's shoulders to prove how good we are at climbing. We climb there to get a better view. And then we choose where we want to go next. I wish you only good choices. This talk is also standing on the shoulders of hundreds of beautiful giants. Scan this link to get a list of selected references. I'm not taking any questions online because I'm not good at this, but feel free to ask me in Slack or send me an email or a Twitter DM. My contacts are on my website. I'm Artem Chistikov. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Artem. That was awesome.